Our next presenter uh, is somebody that we have really grown to, uh, to love because she makes us all uh, about as smart as humanly possible about uh, a great variety of post-production issues. She works at Dolby Labs. She came up to San Francisco earlier this year and presented this uh, keynote about DCP. Um, we also combined that with a little bit of a discussion around independent theatrical distribution and the efficiencies that DCP provides for that route. Um, so we're going to have a kind of split conversation here. She's going to lead you through some highly technical and highly valuable information. So I'd like to start with just a snapshot of where the film industry is on the conversion from 35 millimeter to digital cinema. And it's actually a lot further along than you might expect. Uh, by the end of 2012, within the US, 84% of all screens were converted to DCP playback. We're expecting to cross 96% this year and about 100% by 2015 which means that 35 millimeter is really becoming just a specialty format for museums, but it's not going to be the primary release format any further. Uh, there are a number of reasons that DCP has taken off so quickly. Uh, there's, there's sort of um, a critical mass. Once you have enough facilities accepting DCP, the distributors are wanting to move further that direction. So the broad acceptance has sort of been a feedback loop for quicker conversion of theaters to D-Cinema. It's not just mainstream multiplexes like Regal and AMC that are using DCPs. It's uh, art house cinemas and museums as well. So we routinely ship DCPs to the Angelica cinemas, to the Clearview cinemas. We've shipped DCPs here to the Film Society at Lincoln Center. Uh, so it's, it's being used pretty widely now. Uh, film festivals are also using DCP. That adoption is growing. And for Academy Award consideration, DCP is one of the primary formats that they accept, uh, along with 35 millimeter. So if you wanted to qualify a film, uh, DCP is one way to do that. There are clear financial benefits to creating a DCP versus a 35 millimeter film print. Uh, the DCP copies are about an order of magnitude less expensive, so roughly $150 to $650 for a DCP versus $1,500 to $2,500 for a film print. The DCP uh, is also more robust than a 35 millimeter film print, um, less prone to being scratched or mangled in a projector, and so not only are the replacement copies less expensive, but you're less likely to need them. The, the 100th screening of a DCP will be as pristine as the first screening. Uh, here's just a slide showing some examples of 35 millimeter print damage. Uh, I started out in the industry as a film projectionist in the mid 1990s. And when I was training, I was told to look for the end of a reel by how much dirt and how many scratches appeared on screen. Now, obviously, that's not something that anyone likes, but uh, that's a reality with a physical medium like film. So I want to talk about what the DCP format actually is for the first section of this talk. Uh, unlike a QuickTime file or a 35 millimeter film print, DCP is actually a collection of files. It's not a single element. It has a modular structure. Uh, the DCP has a standardized format, so it's interoperable. Any post-production facility that makes a DCP, uh, that DCP can play back on any server in the field, and uh, there, there shouldn't be any issues with a Dolby DCP playing on a Sony server or with a Technicolor DCP playing on a Dolby server. Everything is following the same guidelines, and so the format is interoperable. Uh, you may hear the buzzword SMPTE DCP, that's sort of the latest and greatest set of standards. Um, the technical differences between interop and SMPTE DCPs are kind of outside the scope of this talk, but I just wanted to make sure you know that interop is still the globally accepted format for DCPs. SMPTE is coming in the next couple of years, but I wouldn't currently recommend mastering a SMPTE DCP at this point. It's just not as widely accepted or as tested 
as the interop format. So with a film print, the physical structure of the film is tying together multiple threads of information. So your video, your subtitles, your audio, everything is married to a single film strip and so you don't have a lot of flexibility to add additional versions. If you need a, say, a Dutch subtitled version of your film, you have to strike a brand new print. Uh, the way subtitles work for digital cinema is generally they exist as a separate file that is rendered by either the server or the projector at the time of playback. And so that video file uh, can be repackaged with different versions of subtitles. And the video can be repackaged with different versions of audio. So this gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, so at the top of the slide, I just have a, an image of a 35 millimeter film print. And at the bottom, you can see uh, a collection of files that constitute a digital cinema package. Uh, the audio and video files are, are sort of highlighted there. And the file that ties that information together for the playback server is called a composition playlist file, or CPL. And a CPL is, is kind of analogous to uh, a playlist on an iPhone or an iPod. It just tells the server what files to play, for how long, and in what order. So just this slide illustrates the, the sort of modular nature of the DCP. Uh, the video file is far and away the largest file within a given DCP. Audio takes up a lot less space, and the CPL files are just vanishingly small. They're, they're like text files, essentially. They're XML, but really small. So if you have a hard drive that has your domestic version of your film and you need a subtitled version, you can quite easily fit that additional CPL with subtitles on the same drive. And this allows for a distribution approach called single inventory, and it's widely used by the major studios. So within Europe, for example, Disney will often ship three, four, five versions of a feature all in the same drive, and then theaters pick and choose which version they've booked and, and intend to play. So they might have a subtitled and a dubbed version on the same hard drive. So this is sort of an overwhelming slide, so I won't dwell on it, but this is, this is what a CPL file <laughs> looks like. It's an XML file, uh, just with sort of starting and ending information for the server. Uh, it's human readable, so I can quickly look at it and tell what it is if I suspect there's a problem with mastering. Just moving on. Uh, the video files within a DCP do need to be compressed. Uh, an uncompressed 2D feature is going to have about two terabytes of visual information which is just enormous. And so the video is compressed using the JPEG 2000 codec with a maximum bit rate of 250 megabits per second. Uh, that's significant. It's approximately 10 times the data rate uh, of a typical Blu-ray disc. Uh, one other comment, color space for D-Cinema is, is expressed in what's called XYZ color, and that's just future-proofing the format for more advanced display technology down the road, so laser projectors, that kind of thing. XYZ color is just an absolute way of expressing a color, whereas RGB is relative and uh, tied to the playback uh, device. Uh, audio files much, much smaller than video. They don't even require compression. They're left uncompressed within the DCP. Uh, both video and audio are packaged into MXF files. So these will have .MXF extensions within a DCP. Uh, and that's just a standardized file format. It stands for material exchange format. Okay, I'll talk briefly about the workflow, so how you go from your finished film to creating this theatrical format, the DCP. Uh, video and audio are separate files within the DCP, so if you're starting from a tape or a QuickTime where your audio and video are married together, the first step is to split that up and handle them differently. So video can enter the workflow at a number of different stages. Uh, the ideal deliverable is called a DCDM, which stands for Digital Cinema Distribution Master. 
And that is a format of uncompressed uh, TIFF files already in the XYZ color space. If we were mastering a DCP for Disney or Warner Brothers, we would expect to receive a DCDM from their post-production lab. Uh, if we're working with an independent filmmaker, we receive a QuickTime or maybe a DPX file sequence. Uh, but as this next slide shows, it's essentially a single video workflow that ends with the JPEG 2000 encoded video. And depending on what sort of video source files you supply, you can sort of slot into that workflow wherever it's appropriate. So uh, as mentioned before, audio remains uncompressed. The standard for DCP is 5.1 channels of audio. So one of the manipulations that we tend to need to perform for audio is, is up mixing from stereo only. Uh, again, that's not something that we would expect from a studio, but for independent filmmakers, it's very common to have just a stereo mix. So as you can see here, we, we would start with, in some cases, a tape or a quick time where audio and video are married together. And the first step is to extract the audio and handle it separately. So going back, the same thing is true with the first step in the video workflow. Okay, uh, I don't want to dwell too long on subtitles. It's not something that everyone in the room is going to need to deal with. Uh, but as I mentioned, subtitles will remain a separate element most of the time in a DCP, which gives you some flexibility for repurposing that video file. Uh, so there's timing information in the subtitle file, along with a font file that instructs the projector how to render the text over the image. And sometimes, in addition to the timing information, there are actual image files of the text, which is more common with Asian languages, uh, not so much with Norwegian or French. So again, this is an XML file, just the way the CPL is. Um, you can see some in and out points here, sort of a time in and time out. And those are just instructions for the projector, or in some cases, the server, whichever device is, is rendering those into the picture. So encryption for digital cinema is optional. For feature films, uh, most distributors are going to require encryption to secure the intellectual property. Having an encrypted DCP means that theaters cannot play it back without uh, a key that licenses them to play it back. So your video, your audio, and your subtitles uh, are all packaged into the DCP with encryption being optional, and the result is video and audio files in the MXF container. And typically, subtitles will remain separate as that XML file, along with the associated font file or text images. Uh, the encryption standard for digital cinema is extremely secure and uh, at least currently pretty impervious to being hacked. Uh, if content is encrypted, uh, files called KDMs are required for every server that's going to play back that DCP. Now the KDMs discriminate between individual composition playlists, so a KDM has to specify exactly one CPL, whether that's your original domestic version or a dubbed version or a subtitled version. The key for one of those versions will not unlock the other versions. The key is specific to exactly one server only, so your post-production lab needs to have the serial numbers ahead of time. And the KDM is only valid during a specific window of time. So once that playback window is up, the KDM expires, and the server can no longer play back an encrypted DCP. So this slide has a lot of information on it. There's, there's a lot that can go wrong in post-production that will make a DCP package a challenge for you. Uh, right now, 24 frames per second is the global standard for DCP. Uh, occasionally, we've been asked to package DCPs at other frame rates. Uh, we can do that. That doesn't necessarily mean it will play everywhere. We've, we've certainly run into issues where a 25 frame per second film will play in one venue and completely fail to be recognized by a server at another venue. So for the most part, we would recommend 24 frames per second. 
I would say for independent filmmakers, uh, another thing to be aware of that comes up all the time is sound being mixed in an uncalibrated room, meaning your soundtrack is either way too loud or way too quiet relative to the rest of the content the theater will be playing. So it's, it's advisable to make sure that you're mixing in a facility that, that knows what they're doing for cinema mixing. So the finished product after the workflow is completed, mastering is done, is a, for a feature, a CRU hard drive. Now that's sort of the de facto standard for the industry. Uh, it's just a specific variety of hard drive that has a, a SATA interface, which is a, a high speed uh, data transfer interface. And that's normally shipped with, you can see the bulkier end toward the, toward the right with the Dolby logo. That portion is actually a removable adapter that allows you to connect this hard drive to servers that only have USB uh, inputs. So that normally would ship with, with its cable set. Uh, it's important to do a full QC start to finish of your film before you begin duplicating and distributing the content, just to check for any errors. Okay, moving on to duplication and distribution. Uh, duplication is done in batches, and each copy created is identical to the master, and we ensure that that's the case through a mathematical verification called a hash check. So if as much as one bit of data is flipped from a zero to a one, say, the entire package will fail, and we know not to ship that drive. Uh, those hash values are also used by servers when the content is loaded at a theater, so the, the server will reject the content if the hash values don't check out. Now this is useful, um, you really only need to check your master, you don't need to QC duplicates of your DCP, all of them are going to be identical to the source. That's certainly not the case with film prints where different batches of chemicals and equipment malfunctions mean that one print run could be very different as far as color uh, compared to another. And currently distribution within the US is done through uh, couriers like FedEx, UPS, uh, DHL for international shipments more often. KDMs are generally sent via email. And I would say, I'm not sure what Michael Tuckman is going to talk about exactly, but Technical support for the theaters that are playing your film is really crucial, and especially if the film is encrypted. You're gonna to wanna to be able to assist theaters that do have problems. It's, it's inevitable that once in a while a hard drive will fail, so sometimes you will need to be ready to ship a replacement. <laughs> so there's, there's certainly a lot that can go wrong with distribution, but so many theaters have been doing DCP for so long now that most of these don't come up very frequently. I would say the most common issues that you will see are with KDMs for encrypted content. Uh, facilities are upgrading their servers all the time and because the KDM is tied to one server only, as soon as they swap out their server, that means you need to send a new KDM, otherwise you risk missing screenings.